you will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You'll hear a mother, Shirley, talking to Kate, an admissions officer at a school. First, you'll have some time to look at questions one to three. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning. You must be Shirley Peters. My name's Kate. Yes, hello. I'm Shirley Peters. Nice to meet you. You have a 10 o'clock appointment with us. That's right. I'm supposed to go to the admissions office. Is that here? Yes, it is. Please take a seat as I have several forms for you to fill in to enable you to enrol your son at this school. We have a form for your name, address and so on one for the health of your son, and one for him to choose extra subjects to join in. Thank you. Now, firstly, this form is just so we have a record of your son's personal details. Can you fill it in for me? Yes, I'll do that now. Can I just check the details with you? Your son's first name is John. No, that's his middle name after his father, Richard John. My son's name is Colwyn. Can you please spell it C-O-L-W-I-N, not C-O-L-W-Y-N, as some people do? Yes, I'll make a note of that. And how old is Colwyn? I've put down that he's entering year six, so therefore he's 11 years old, turning 12 this year. So at the moment, he's 11? Yes, correct. You now have some time to look at questions four to ten. Now answer questions 4 to 10. Let's move on to your address. Do you live at 7 Watley Crescent, Mount Lawley? Yes, that's right. The street is spelt W-H-A-T-L-E-Y Crescent in Mount Lawley. Yes, I can see you've written that. Which phone number is best to contact you on? Well, I'm out and about doing things during the day, so probably my mobile rather than the home number. So that's 041 Yes, 041 Secondly, can you complete this form regarding your son's health? Yes, I'll do it for you now. Thank you. Now, can I go through the more important areas of this form with you to make sure our information is accurate? Yes, of course. Is your son taking any medication at the moment that the teachers will need to be aware of? Yes, he has asthma, so he will be carrying his puffer in his school bag. So he has a puffer. Is he allergic to anything? Yes, peanuts. Actually, he should avoid all types of nuts. That's OK, because we have a policy of not having any nuts in our school. Is there anything else that you think we should be aware of? As I've written down, he also wears glasses, which he needs to keep on all the time. I'll highlight that section on the form so his teacher will know about his glasses. Finally, this school has a wide range of interesting subjects that your son can participate in. Could you mark on this form what your son would like to do? Yes, certainly. 
here you are. Firstly, it seems your son is particularly interested in football, so I'll make a note of that. Secondly, with regard to music, would you like him to start learning the piano in music class? Yes, that would be fantastic. Now, turning to art, I'll let his art teacher know that he likes drawing cartoons. Wonderful. Finally, let's look at languages now. Did you know that Mandarin was actually only started at the school this year? Really? Well, I think Chinese would be the most useful, even though my son's friends have already been learning Indonesian and Italian. Well, now we have all the information we require about your son. We hope he enjoys himself at our school. I'm sure he will. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a recorded message giving information about an area where tourists can visit to taste local food. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully to the first part of the message and answer questions 11 to 13. Welcome to the tourist information line for the Valley Food Trail. Here you will find many local food products for you to sample and buy. It is possible for you to spend as much or as little time as you want, but I suggest that you allow a full day for touring this area. Of course, there are many half-day tours available for those of you short on time. Now, it's quite a large area and stretches from Brookville to Ford Hill. For those of you unfamiliar with the area, that means that it is 10 kilometres to 35 kilometres from the city centre, or by car 15 minutes to the closest point, continuing to 55 minutes at its furthest point from the CBD. Of course, apart from food, there are many other places of interest in this area, including cafes and restaurants and galleries and studios. But I wouldn't recommend you go here to see parks and gardens. The other information lines will give you specific information related to these particular attractions. Before the final part of the message, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 14 to 20. Now answer questions 14 to 20. But let's go back to food. If we begin in Brookville and head north towards Upper Valley in a clockwise direction, passing West Valley on West Road, we cross over Coast Road to come to our first place of interest, Magic Coffee. 
This is not to be confused with the coffee house, situated opposite on the other side of the valley on the railway line. Magic Coffee is next to the chocolate company, which is on the corner. Just past the ice cream shop on the corner of John Street is the fresh produce shop. A little further north, we have reached Ford Hill, where we can start our drive southwards along Great Northern Highway following the railway line. First, we come to the organic market near the corner of Memorial Avenue and then to Olive Farm opposite Olive Road. Just before we come to the next street crossing, we see the Honey Pot, which is practically opposite the coffee house. There is another chocolate company which sells nougat as well, just nearby. Following the railway line along Great Northern Highway, we return back to Brookville. Now, as I have said previously, if you only have a few hours to spare, there are several places that you shouldn't miss. The two chocolate places make equally nice chocolate, but the factory has the added bonus of nougat, unlike the company. Of course, everyone loves ice cream, especially unusual flavours such as coffee and nougat. So the ice creamery is definitely worth a visit. And while the coffee house sells expertly made hot drinks, including hot chocolate, I think your time would be better spent sampling the many products on offer at the organic market. Well, I hope you enjoy your time visiting the Valley Food Trail and enjoy all the wonderful local foods on offer. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear an interview with Professor Green from a local university which enrols a large number of overseas students in its courses. He is talking to Indra, a student representative about the importance of attending lectures. First, you will have half a minute to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully to the interview and answer questions 21 to 30. Good afternoon, Professor Green. Thank you for your time today. I wonder if you could explain why you think it is important for us to attend lectures in a course that we are studying. Well, despite the increasing dependence on online communication these days, I do think it is important. Apart from delivering the content of the lecture itself, I believe that there are some general communication benefits from having large groups of students together in one place. For lecturers, it is an opportunity for us to address many students together at one time. For students, it helps you to feel part of the wider learning community who are following the course. You can interact with each other both before and after the lecture to discuss the ideas and content, networking with each other and comparing your notes. But isn't most of this achieved, as you said, these days through online communication? Well, lecturers do communicate with students online, of course, but we usually only give a summary or notes of the lecture, 
So there are significant differences. When you go to lectures, you get more of an insight into what the lecturer considers important. We give additional commentary and anecdotes, and by voice emphasis, we can alert you to the key concepts, theories, and issues of the subject. By not attending lectures, you might miss crucial information about what we are expecting in an assignment. You know, these extra things can make a difference. Okay, but there are tutorials. There is a lot of interaction between students and lecturers in tutorials. Can't all this be done in tutorial discussion groups instead of having lectures? Yes, to some extent. But during lectures, the lecturers can sensitise you to the debates and the controversies that are dealt with in the literature. This can help you think more critically about the subject. So then, when you come to the tutorial, you'll be able to come with some questions and ideas for discussion. The result of this is that the tutorial class will be more beneficial for everyone who attends. I see your point. However, surely this also depends on whether students are able to understand and follow the lecture well. What strategies do you recommend to help students get the most out of lectures? I would say that first of all, it is important to do some pre-reading. By doing this, you get an orientation to the topic. You'll become familiar with the key terms and you'll be able to follow the lecture points more easily. I also think it is good to arrive early to collect handouts and to find a seat where it is easy to see and hear what is going on. Then, importantly, during the lecture itself, you need to be attentive. I know from experience that it is often difficult to be attentive. What can students do to improve their attentiveness during the lecture? I think that there are two keys to following a lecture successfully, using the visual cues, and using active listening techniques. By maintaining eye contact with the lecturer and following how the lecturer makes use of the slides, whiteboard and so on, you are using the lecturer's visual cues which help make the structure of the information clear and give you a sense of what's important. Then using active listening techniques will also help you to process the information. What do you mean by active listening techniques? Well, you need to pay attention to the methods the lecturer uses to highlight important information. As I said before, in the spoken language of a lecture, we get the benefit of things such as stress and intonation, use of examples and anecdotes, as well as the language signals used to show relationships between ideas. Yes, I see what you mean. These things will be missing in written summaries. And what about taking notes? Does that help? Taking notes helps you to concentrate, so I would certainly advise you to do that. It's difficult to listen and write good notes at the same time, so it does take some training. Yes, taking notes needs a lot of practice, I've found. Do you have any other advice? Well, I can't finish without stressing the importance of formulating questions while you are listening. During the lecture, you should ask yourself questions about the content of the lecture and the points you are following. Ask questions like, what are the benefits or problems? What other examples are there? How does it work? Why does this happen? This will keep you focused and actively engaged in the content of the lecture. Professor Green, thank you very much for your valuable tips and your time today. You are very welcome. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three.
Part 4 You will hear an expert on birds talking about sparrows, one of the most common bird species in urban and suburban environments around the world. The expert discusses some possible causes for their declining numbers. First, you will have half a minute to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 40. Some people dislike sparrows and see them as annoying pests in their neighbourhood. Others see them as an interesting part of the urban environment. Love them or hate them, it could be that the familiar scene of these birds flying, hopping and chirping in our city streets will soon become a thing of the past. Until recently, there were so many sparrows around that people tried all kinds of methods to get rid of them but it now seems that many people are starting to worry about the declining numbers of sparrows in many cities around the world. Over the past 20 or 30 years, sparrows have been disappearing throughout many parts of the world. In Britain, since the 1920s, the overall population of sparrows has declined by 92%. In London, they were once so plentiful that people who conducted regular surveys did not bother to count them because they were simply too common. Now there are none. This decline has also been recorded in some cities in continental Europe, parts of North America and India as well. Some people will be surprised at this as they probably still see many sparrows in their local neighbourhood. But whereas some suburbs may have large numbers of sparrows, in the next suburb there may be none. So, why are they disappearing rapidly in some areas, yet still exist in large numbers in others? Well, it is a bit of a mystery. Some say it is due to local issues. There are a number of factors here, one of which is harassment or predation. Other local animal species harass them and domestic cats hunt them for food. Secondly, there is increased competition both for food and for nesting sites from other seed-eating birds in the neighbourhood. And thirdly, it is now more difficult for sparrows to make nests in modern buildings due to more effective modern building methods. Recent studies suggest that another reason may be related to a problem with the breeding success of the sparrows. Although they continue to breed, the young nestlings keep dying. These deaths have been linked to a lack of insects, such as aphids. This decrease in the availability of insects, it is believed, then causes the young nestlings to die of starvation or dehydration. It seems that there is a growing worldwide shortage of insects, and our modern urban lifestyle with the increasing use of motor vehicles is being blamed for it. It is suggested that the carcinogenic chemicals released into the atmosphere by unleaded car exhaust fumes is having an impact on insect numbers. Another theory, which is thought to be affecting sparrow numbers, is connected to our technological advancement. According to some experts, the mobile telephone towers that are now a feature of our modern cities emit electromagnetic radiation, which might affect the sparrow's central nervous systems and result in their death. The evidence is only circumstantial, and sparrows still continue to thrive in some major cities. However, it is interesting to note that in the 1990s, the use of mobile phones and unleaded petrol skyrocketed, and both coincide with the period of the sparrows' declining numbers in many modern cities. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.